Hello everyone, this is Alex Ipatov and this is the third video of the series on Rook endgames. In this video I'm going to talk about the long side short side principle. Please remember that if you're on a defending side in a Rook endgame, try to keep your Rook on the long side and your King on the short side, just like in this example. Black's Rook has three files between itself and the White's King. Those files are B file, C file and D file. It's a draw if it's black to move in this position. If it's white to move, then white would play rook g1 check, cutting off the black king by two files, which is enough to win. But it's black to play and it's a draw, so black has to play rook a7 check. The main move is rook d7, but first let's take a look at king d8. If white plays king d8, then we can see all the strengths of this principle in action. Black simply keeps on checking and throwing the white king away from the e pawn. So rook a check, king c7, rook a7 check, king b6, rook e7. Once the white king has been thrown away from e pawn, the black rook attacks the pawn, rook e1, king f6, and the white king is too far away from the e6 pawn. So king d8 is not good for white. So now let's take a look at move rook d7. After rook d7, black plays rook e8. Please remember that in this position, the a8 is the best square for the rook, because it controls the 8th rank, so I mean, white cannot play king d8 or king e8, discover check, and then e7. And uh, second, I mean, the rook is better placed on a8 than on b8, for example, because it has more files between itself and the white king, so it's on the long side. Once again, there are three files between the rook and the king, and it's enough for a draw, usually. And the uh, best squares for the black king are g7 and g6. So if it were black to play in this position, the best move would be king g6. The rook on a8 should be untouched, I mean, if it's not necessary. Now let's take a look at white moves here. If white play king d6 check, I mean, black king simply comes closer to the pawn, threatening rook a6 check. And if rook f7 check, then king g6, once again, threatening rook a6 check, and checks on the a file. So king d6 doesn't work. Let's take a look at move rook b7, just a waiting move. White doesn't want to force anything, just playing rook b7. If white waits, then black can wait as well. Black can play king g6. Once again, keeping the rook untouched on a8, because this is the best square for the rook. King d6 and king f6. Once the white king leaves e7, the black king immediately comes closer to the e pawn, threatening rook a6 check. Rook f7 check, then king g6, and if e7, then king f7. If king d7, then simply rook e8, and the white king has to go back to d6, and it's a draw. Alright, so now let's take a look at some other move. If white plays rook d8, then black checks, king d6, if king e8 then simply king f6, rook d6 and rook e7 check, and rook takes e6 on the next move, so king e8 is not good, so white has to play king d6, threatening e7 on the next move, black plays rook a6 check, kicking the white king away from the e pawn, if king e5 one more check, White has to stop the black checks by playing rook d5. And after the white rook left the 8th rank, then the black rook comes back to a8. As I already said many times, this is the best square for the rook. If white plays e7, then king f7 is a draw. And if rook d7 check, then king g6. The best squares of the black king are g6 and g7. And the best square for the rook is on a8, because it is as far as possible from the white king. And white cannot make any progress in this position. So this is uh, another example of the long side short side principle. The defensive method here is the same. Black keeping the king on the short side and the rook on the long side. So in this position is black to move, so black plays king c8 because the queen side is a short side and the king side is a long side for the rook. Rook g8 check, king b7, king d7, 
And now we bring the rook to the long side. We play rook h1, rook e8. We play rook a7 check. Once again, as in the previous position, there are three files between the rook and the opponent's king, and it's enough for a draw usually. Rook e7, and now we play rook h8. This is the best square for the rook. And the best squares for the black king are b7 and b6. d6, king b6, and it's a draw. If it were black to play here, then black would play king b7. So black just waits for the king, king b7, king b6, king b7. And in case if the white rooks leaves the 7th rank, then black starts checking with rook h7 check and so on. Now let's take a look at another example, similar to the Philidor position. It was white to move, white plays king f6. Now there are two moves that make a draw for black. The first move is rook e1. This is method 2 from the first video on Philidor position. But there is another move that also makes a draw, and this move is rook f1 check. King e6, and now black plays king f8, moving the king to the short side. Rook b8 check, king g7, king e7, and rook a1, keeping the rook long. Rook d8, rook a7 check, rook d7, and rook e8. Once again, a8 is the best square for the rook, and the best squares for the king are g7 and g6. e6 and king g6. And we have already seen this position before. Alright, now let's take a look at a bit modified example. If the rook is short, like in this position. So there are only two files between the black rook and the white king. So in this case, it's lost. Because two files is usually not enough for a draw. This position is white to move and win. In order to understand the solution, let's ask ourselves what happens in case of the most direct move, which is rook a1, threatening rook g1 check. Black doesn't have really a choice, rook b7 is forced, king d8, rook b8 check, king c7, and rook b2. Now black wants to play king f8 or king f6, attacking the e-pawn, rook f1. And now black has time to put the rook on the long side by playing rook a2. e7, rook a7 check. And now there are three files between the rook and the king, and now it's a draw. Black simply checks. King d7, rook a7 check, king e6, rook a6 check. King e5 check, king d4 check, check. If king goes somewhere, then simply rook e5. Alright, so now we saw why rook a1 leads to a draw, because black is in time to bring the rook to the a file, making it long. So the solution here is to make a triangle with the king on squares d6, d7, and e7, and give the move right to black, so that black would play in this position. So white plays king d6 check, king f6, king d7. Black doesn't have anything better than going back to g7. And now white plays king e7, and we get the starting position with black to move. As I already said in previous examples, the best square for the king are squares g7 and g6. So black plays king g6. And now white can play rook a1. Because now the king is on g6, not on g7, as it was in the first variation of this position. I'll show you the difference just now. Rook b7 check, king d8, rook b8 check, king c7, rook b2, and rook e1. And now black doesn't have king f8 because it's too far away from this square. If the king were on g7, then black would have had king f8, e7 check, king e8, blocking the e pawn. But with the king on g6, it's not possible. So white wins by playing rook e1, threatening e7, e8. Black can check, but it's lost. King goes to e8. The next move is e7. And white wins. Rook a2, e7. Rook a8 check, king d7, 
check, kick to six, check, and white escapes from checks, and this position is winning. So what we saw in this position that in this particular example the black's rook was too short, there were only two files between the rook and the king, and it was not enough for a draw. White's winning plan was to give the move to black in this position by making a triangle with the king. So if it's black to play in this position, black plays king g6, and then white can bring the rook to a1 in order to cut off the black king. And then after black makes few checks with the rook, rook b7, king d8, rook b8 check, king c7, rook b2, we have rook e1. And this is a difference between having the black king on g7 and g6. Now the black king doesn't have f8 square at his disposal. All right, now let's take a look at another example where the rook is short. So it's almost a similar example that a uh, few positions before. Just the white rook is on h7 and not on g7. So this is a very small difference, but it's very, very important. So black tries to follow the same defensive method, keeping the king on the short side and rook on the long side. But now it doesn't work because rook can go to h file, king b7, king d7, and h1 square is uh, at white's disposal. So black cannot play rook h1 himself, he has to go to g1, but now it's totally a different story because there are only two files between the black rook and the white king. d6, rook g7 check, king e6, threatening d7. So if black plays king c6, then rook c8 check wins, and d7. So king c6 doesn't work, then rook g6, then king e7, once again threatening d7, rook g7 check, and king f6. And we see that the black rook is too short. If the black rook were on h7, then rook h6 check would be impossible, but it's not possible in this particular position, so it's lost. If the rook goes to g1, then d7 wins. If the rook goes to d7, then king e6 wins. Rook g7 and now d7. That was the video on the long side short side principle. Thank you for watching. It was Alex Ipatov.